Hello and welcome to another episode of the AI Show. Happy Monday! So, um, did it feel extra early for anyone else or just me? Or just me? By the way, where is everybody coming from? I'd love to see where everyone's coming from. Uh, and while you type that in... Um, we have a fabulous show for you today. Pretty excited about it. Um, in fact, time for our pandemic purchase. I only use this Wacom tablet for the show. So, I mean, if you're wondering, was it worth it? Yes, it was. It was uh, totally worth it. Let's see if it's working for us today. Let's see if it's working. Where's, where's everybody coming from, by the way? Just type it in there. I don't know if you know this, but there's like a 30 second delay between when I say something and when you hear it. I don't know it's to, if it's to protect the YouTube airwaves or the restream or the, I'm sorry, or the um, Twitch airwaves. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But... Uh, Tell us where you're coming from, and then I'll uh, give you a little shout out. But beforehand, um, I'll tell you what we're doing today. It's actually quite cool stuff. Uh, number one, uh, we have Adina on again. Uh, she was on a I don't know if it was a I don't know how long. We'll have to ask her. Uh, but there is some cool stuff <clears throat> with a large model multi multi modal completely artisanal ai model no cheese in it whatsoever no cheese whatsoever artisanal vegan um everything everything uh certified Certified organic. Certified organic. Just mostly, and I'm going to go to a red pen here. Red pen. Delicious. Like if you were to savor this, this model, you would, you would love it. And not only are you going to love it, it's literally a cool model. And she explains it really well. So we'll, we'll thank her for that in a little bit. So make sure you get your questions ready for her. Number two, we figured out our little issue with Rochambeau for training. Uh, remember when we were add more images? It was the old use effect problem. You know the one. You know the one. The old use effect Feels like it used us. We fixed it. And now I'm going to see if I can do even more. Because I want to capture images. Um, so, all right. Uh, this is what we're doing today. And the show goes by really fast. I Like, we used to do two hours, and it that went by really fast. And now we're only to one hour Monday mornings just to get you ready for your week with some AI goodness. Uh, we are going to be... We have a we have a pretty good lineup of shows. Like, through May. Is Peggy here? Let's see. We, we have shows, like, through May. Uh, there may be an open AI show coming up soon, since there's a lot of goodness coming on that, and so make sure we'll let you know in advance. That way you can bring people. Um, all right, let's see where everyone's coming from in the chat. All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Brasileiro. Welcome, my friend. Uh, 
let's see the name here. Uh, oh, I can't. Oh, Leandro Vieira. Welcome, my friend. From Kenya. Wonderful place. I was there one time. And I want to go back. So welcome uh, from Kenya. Jason from Toronto is here. Pretty excited about that. Oh. I forgot to press play on this other thing, so apologize on that. Hello, welcome. Uh, from Toronto, from London. Oh, man. My wife loves London. Not only that, she's got, like, cousins that live in Cam- near Cambridge. So, I'm just saying. If I could live anywhere, it'd probably be London. Uh, Rochambeau model is better. Someone's trying to write something in a different language. Let's see if I can, let's see if I can see it. Yeast, yes, jo, kato, ruskovo, ruskovo, voryashchi. I don't know what that means, but I think I said it right. Nordico, Flindan, Finlando, Janiscu, number seven. Uh, bringing up the twitch hello from beirut lebanon hello welcome my friend welcome uh from canada our mighty neighbors from the north welcome my friend uh, and then from libya i think that's in syria did i get that wrong um we're not you know we're not us americans are not why am i not zoomed in correctly zoom me in camera uh, we're not known for knowing where things are, so I'm I'm trying to help that. From Ukraine, welcome, my friend. My heart goes out to you, friend. My friends there in the Ukraine. Um, obviously a difficult time. Uh, hello from Cambodia. Uh, wow, look at we have so many cool people. Ethiopia, which is uh, just north of Kenya, if I remember right. Eritrea, just above that. Look at that. Yes, I know my places. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm pretty excited for everyone. Uh, Singapore, Adrian. And then we have Massachusetts. So glad everyone's here. Welcome. So I think it's time to uh, welcome our guest. Uh, let's see. Adina, are you there? Well, we'll, see. we'll see. There she is. Let me let me bring her on. How you doing, Adina? Hello. I'm tempted to say good morning, but it's morning at my time. Uh, I so, know. Hello, it's everyone. like literally people are from everywhere. Uh, we decided to do 8.30, which is early for us, but it's extra early because of daylight savings time. We have that weird thing here. So uh, how are you? Are you surviving it, Adina? Barely, barely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm everyone like I'm half awake, but I promise I'll do my best. That's okay. So we, what we decided to do is pre, we were pre-recorded the official one, but Adina's here to answer any questions whatsoever, even the hard ones. Uh, and we have to pay extra for that. So thank you, Adina, for that uh, goodness. All right. So let's queue up the video. And for those that are wondering, today we're talking about a new multimodal model available on cognitive services. And you're going to be surprised, shocked, and delighted by what you see here. Let's play it right now. You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show, where we talk all about next generation computer vision capabilities with Project Florence with my friend Adina Trufinescu. Make sure you tune in. Hello and welcome to this episode of the AI Show. We're talking all about next generation computer vision capabilities with Project Florence with my friend Adina Trufinescu. Hello, Adina. How are you doing, my friend? I said, thank you for having me. Also, oh, so tell us who you are and what you do. We've had you on before. It's been a while, though. Yeah, it, yeah I know. It's been a while. So um, uh, Adina Trufinescu, uh, Product Manager, uh, Azure uh, Cognitive Services for Vision. I've been in this space for four years now. Uh, we've had a recent release, so I'm super excited to be here. Uh, n- now, it's not just a recent release. It's pretty exciting. I've been hearing all about this thing called Project Florence. Is this the release? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, for sure. So, um, 
you know, I guess the audience knows, uh, you know, for the past two years, the AI industry has moved towards large foundation models. So by now, everybody knows about ChatGPT. You've heard about BERT and DALI. Uh, so this is the first time when Cognitive Services for Vision is launching a large foundation model. The code name is Florence. Um, there are research papers published on this. Uh, you can look it up. Um, this is a large foundational model trained with a, a massive uh, amount of data, uh, billions of text to image pairs. Uh, it is a multimodal, sorry, it is a multimodality model, meaning that it's both language and vision. Uh, and because of that, it enables new tasks uh, in the vision AI space. So basically, um, these are the things I'm going to show later, but something like uh, text to image retrieval uh, or dense caption. So basically, the language capabilities and the visual vision capabilities are merged together uh, in this new foundational model. So how do these things actually work? And now you brought a slide, and I want to make sure you explain this, because I think... For those that are hearing about large language models, when we talk about multimodal models, they're a little bit different. Can you explain them to us? Yeah, so uh, think of it this way. Before, to train a model in vision, you would find like a data set for that particular task. So if you want to train a model for object detection, you label the data for object detection and you train a model which is pretty much like specific to that task. And then for each task, you'll have to train an independent model. Whereas now with the large foundation model, you train the large foundation model once. So this is where you bring like the, the large data set, the, the large training data set. Uh, and then you train the foundation model. In this case, the foundation model for Vision Project Florence, it has both a language encoder and image encoder. So this is where the language and, and vision capabilities are being, you know, come together. And then you train adaptation models. So these are adaptation models which are fine-tuned with additional data for the individual tasks. So the individual tasks that we show here are classification, image retrieval, object detection, segmentation, captions, and then coming in the future, we have like a bunch more that, I, you know, that are going to come in the future. So the idea here is that you train the, the large foundation once, and then you adapt it for the individual tasks. I see. So help me understand this, and because this is the part that sometimes is confusing, at least to me. When you're training a multimodal model, and I have some training in machine learning, my understanding is that when you're doing machine learning, there is like the right answer, and then there's like the input, and you're trying to minimize a loss function over those things. What does this look like for multimodal things? Because it has language and uh, uh, vision. What is it? calculating a loss over in order to optimize its parameters? The data set is uh, image and text pairs, meaning that you go and find the data set where the images, the images also have not labels, but they have the description of the image. And then basically the image to text pair is pushed through the training process. And this is where we uh, have contrastive learning, which is like another form of like self-supervision learning. And basically in this process to train like a vision and language model, this is where a language encoder and an image encoder are being trained such that you can push like the images and text through the same model. And then this is where you bring together like both capabilities of language and vision. I see. So, so basically, because I, I don't know, in my narrow thinking, it's like, oh, we have a single problem and we're trying. But now these foundational models are learning separate encodings, but then they're putting them together as they go through the optimization phase. Right. And then that's why the adaptation models come in, because the large foundation model is good at like zero shot, like this broad range kind of things. But then if you want to have like high accuracy for very narrow tasks that this is where you do additional fine tuning of the large foundational model. So the, if you look at this image, you have the training data, which is like the massive training data that you train the foundational model. You have the foundational model itself, and then you have these adaptation models. And then these adaptation models actually produce the individual models for the tasks above. I see. So it's basically the, the large foundational model has a joint latent space with these two different modalities. That is correct. And then, you know, in the fullness of time, what we're striving for is like full modality. So when you're talking about like, you're talking about images, right? So images are pretty much like 
language and image, and then you have that dual modality. But then when you bring in video into the picture, this is where you have like multi, you, this is where your true modality, you know, comes in. I see. And that, that makes a lot more sense because like, I think for some reason I heard the adaptation models and I just heard that way too fast. You're basically training the base model to understand images and text at the same time. And then you're using the adaptation models to specifically go to a, a task. Right. And then some tasks were not possible before. For instance, when you, we have a new task for, uh, we call it text to image retrieval. And this enables like uh, finding similar images with a text query. That, pos that was not possible before because you didn't have like a language model and you didn't have the multimodality. I see. Because they, they're now in the joint space. If you're typing some text, give me all the elephants it's able to know about what a picture of an elephant looks like with those words kind of thing. That's right. So think about like you push the words to the language part of the model, the language encoder, and do you extract vectors in a vector mm -hmm. space. You push the images through the an image encoder, you extract the vectors in the same vector space, and then you find the cosine distance between vectors, and this way you find similar images. Absolutely brilliant. I'd love to see some of this stuff in practice. Do you have a demo of what this looks like for people that don't want to? I'm a fan of the latent space and vector math. I'm a huge fan. But for people that just want to use this stuff, uh, how could they do this for their business? So um, this is where Vision Studio comes into play. So I'm going to show you that. So if you're familiar with the studios for cognitive services, we have a speech studio. We have a language studio. This is Vision Studio. We are very happy that you can actually use it. I'm going to show you in a minute. And you can use it as a signed in Azure user for more complex tasks, but you can actually use it without even being signed in. So That's let me cool. show you. Let me show you what it is. All right. So what you see here is Vision Studio. And you can see the features are organized by type. Uh, so you can see optical character recognition, spatial analysis, image analysis. Uh, and under the feature task, uh, the feature tab you can find here like the latest things and let me start by showing you uh image captions so image captions we had this for a while um image captions we reached human parity in 2020 but with the large foundation model now enabling image captions like the the uh, quality of image captions continues to improve so I'm going to show you a few samples with the images that Vision Studio already has here. So we have a group of cows gazing a field. Um, you know, let me click on this one. A man holding a surfboard, surfboard on a rock. So this is the image description of the picture. The reason why I'm showing you this is because we have now dense captions. So let me take you to the tab. And dense captions is basically providing you not only the caption of the full image, which is you know, what this one is doing here, but it's giving you 10 regions inside the image with their particular descriptions. So think of it as, you know, if you think about like the object detection, you know, this would be like object detection with labels of objects. But in this case, it's giving you regions inside the image and it's giving you the description of the image. So we call and, this and the model is the, is it is the adaptation model doing that all on top of the the, the large model without yeah the, yeah yeah that cool. is correct so this is an example of an adaptation model for captions and dense captions that's cool cool all right let me show you one that I love I I I'm really <laughs> I'm really excited about this one this is the text to image retrieval uh, we call it image retrieval uh, the actual scenario actually is like searching for photos with natural language. This is where the open vocabulary capabilities of the model come in because of the, the amount of you know, training data that goes in the model, you pretty much like can search with anything. Uh, so this is where the language, uh, the natural language capabilities come in. And we have here a set of sample images that we provided for you to try with. Uh, if you're not signed in, you'll be able to try and try with these images and then you can bring your own. So I'm going to show you like how to bring your own. But first, let me pick one of these. And what we did here, we are, let me position it. Um, we are giving you a search query example. 
just for you to see like the kind of things that you can search for. And then you can also bring your own custom search query. So let me pick like a few of these. We have uh, employee wearing a white safety hat. So you can see here like the top 10 results. And then see this slider here. Mm -hmm. You know, the model when it's looking for similarity in the vector space, um, you know, the vector space is broad and is calculated based off all the images in the set. Right. So if you want to see like the most relevant results, this is what you do. But if you want to see like, you know, all, all the search results and then you can pick your like whatever, you know, uh, relevance, uh, you know, you are comfortable with. So this is how you play with it. And notice here, like as the images are ranked here based on similarity, you'll start seeing like the results which are not exactly what you are searching for, but still within like that similarity uh, space. That that's cool, uh, and it's it's all based upon that same model, which is absolutely amazing. Use, we used to have to train like a ton of specialized models for all these things, and each one needed to be babysat, so to speak. It's cool that you're able to do this all with one large model and some tiny adaptation models. Yeah, that's right. So the other thing that I want to show you here is um, you can bring your own search query. So the one that I want to show you here is. Um, person driving a forklift, which is within the realm of uh, of manufacturing. So you can find here like top search uh, results, like you can see people driving forklifts. So um, whether you uh, try something that we suggest or you bring your own thing, then you can do that here. And like I said, um, you can bring your own images. So. You can try it with your own images. So you can bring your collection. I already have my collection here. These are my personal photos. So you can see like my dog and things which are going on here. So let me show you like a couple of things. So let me come here and then I'm going to say white dog, which is kind of an obvious one. So you can see like my puppy being displayed here. Um, but then the model, I told you that the model has been trained with this like huge amount of data. It can reason with external knowledge and it knows of things. So it can find things which, even if they are not labeled, you know, you can find them. So I'm gonna give you an example and it's gonna be obvious. So I have a picture here in my data set. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, let me reset, reset the search. And I have, look at this picture here. This is the picture of Horseshoe Bend on Colorado River. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can search here with Colorado River. And you'll notice like the first, you know, similar image, the top result is actually the horseshoe bed, bend on Colorado River. And this requires like no metadata, no GPS information, and you will find this kind of thing. So you can say Bryce Canyon. And then the model will know to find the images coming from Bryce Canyon. And then the last one that I love is Mount Rainier. And then it's going to find the pictures that I have, you know, with my hikes on Mount Rainier. And this is, I don't think people, if I'm understanding this right, these are just random pictures that you uploaded into the system. You ran the, the, the search query. Without having to do anything, the model was able to do all of this searching without even having to specialize. That is correct. So basically, what you come here and then you can try it yourself. You bring your images from either your blob storage or your local disk. The images are actually, you. it will take a little bit of time because each image is going to be pushed to the model to extract the vectors for each image. And then think of it as you have like an index built for your set of images. And then you come with the text query, and then the text query is going to be pushed through the model. We extract the vectors from the text query. And then every time when you click search here, we calculate you know, the similarity by doing cosine distance between the vectors of the text and vectors of the images in the data set. And the relevance just basically widens the angle for, for the return result, I'm guessing. Exactly, yeah. So basically, look at this one. Like, if I say most relevant, you'll notice here that each image has Mount Rainier in it. Mm -hmm. If I move the slider, you'll see things coming in which 
may or may not be. So some, you see what I mean? Like, you know, the, the similarity, this is where you come in. And then as you build your own, uh, you know, as you start using the APIs and as, as you get these kind of results, you'll have tolerance, you know, different users and different use cases have like different tolerance for the similarity. And we don't cut off to like some number of results. We give you like the full similarity and then you decide what's relevant for you. That's cool. So is there any other aspects of Florence that uh, Project Florence you wanted to show us before I asked, asked another obvious question that's coming to me? Uh, let me show you the search capabilities on video. All right. Oh, wait, so, video? Yes. So let's talk about video for a minute because this one is interesting. Um, this is a demo for how to do frame locator and summary on videos. And I have here sample videos that we provide for you. And then same as before, you can try it with your own video. The problem with video today is that there are many cameras deployed on physical spaces. Uh, there are petabytes of video that are being stored every day. But imagine having to search you know, video footage for events of interest. Like it can take like, you know, if, if there is a security incident, for instance, it can take like hours or days to actually find the incident in like video footage. So this is where video summarization and video search or rather frame locator comes in where you can actually, you know, take a video snippet, run it through summarization, see a summary of what's going on and then get some idea of like the things that are happening and then the things that you can search for. That's immediately useful just for editing a video, for example, if I could say, oh, I remember when Adina said this thing and I just type it in and it can go to the frame, that would be really cool too. That is true, but with the correction that it's not when Adina said something because we are not processing audio yet. Uh -huh. It's when, you know, Adina, Adina did something. Which is even mean? harder to, because I mean, processing audio, you can get the text out of, but it's like, oh, she showed me this window that had this, you know, she showed me apples and then it would go to the frame where you're showing me apples. It's basically what you're saying. Am I getting this right? Yeah, yeah. The, the same it. idea of like finding similar images. So think about videos as collection of images. It's Got just it. that they are organized in a, in a video stream, right? So same as before, when you come in with a set of images, now you come in with a set of frames, we sample a set of frames from the video and then we build a summary and then we build the search index by by collecting you know uh, extracting the vectors from the frames and mm -hmm. then same as before we can do like text similarity between the input text and the video frames in the video all right let's take a look at it all right so i have like a bunch of things but i'm going to choose the data center one so this is a video of people doing things in a data center uh -oh. uh, where, you know, some things uh, should be done, some things shouldn't. So I'm not going to comment on that. So basically, you can summarize this video. And then you can see here the things that are happening. And what we are doing here, we are trying to highlight the interesting things that are happening such that that can give you an idea of like uh, what to search for. So we have here the summary and then the interesting events with a person seeing running, a person seeing falling, uh, uh, unattended backpack, workers uh, showing climbing ladders. So now you can come here and then you say locate specific frames. And same as before, we give you ideas what to search for, but let's search for the things that the summary told us that are, that are happening. So we have person uh, climbing, a ladder. So let's see what it finds. So basically, it found like multiple frames here. So you can click on the frame and then you can see the frames where the person was found. You know, you can click show more and that's going to give you like additional frames. We had one with person, um, person falling. So let's try that one. So there we go. We found it. And then same as before, you can see the multiple results. And let's pick one of these ones here, person with a laptop. Uh, there we go, person with a laptop walking through. So you get the idea. So basically you, you have the same you know, idea as before, except now that you are finding frames inside videos. 
that that is that's awesome um and it's cool that once you understand the basic knowledge of the foundational model how many adaptations there are is pretty impressive now the question i have for you to follow up there's there's got to be some ways to customize these models or the adaptations is that possible at all yeah so um the foundation model uh can also be customized uh, we offer two customization tasks, uh, the most popular ones for um, uh, image classification and object uh, detection. Mm -hmm. So actually, let me show you uh, these capabilities here. I am going to uh, show you the a model that I trained. And to train a model, uh, you need a training data set. So I have here a training data set. Um, I already have the blob storage with the, the training data. This is a, a, a custom model that detects commercial drones. And you'll notice here that in Vision Studio, there is no such thing as a labeling experience. That is because we are now using the same label experience as Azure Machine Learning is using for training Azure Machine Learning models. So yeah, so one of the problem customers complained before was that you know with the custom vision service today, you have to label the data in some format. In Azure Machine Learning, you have to label it in different format. If you want to train models in both services and compare, you have to label the data once. So this is where now you can go into Azure Machine Learning and label your data. And I'm going, I'm going to show you like the kind of data that we have here. So let's go to the data. And then you'll see here images of drones. Um, so let's see, review labels. So this is an object detection. So for, for uh, simplicity, we have a single label, it's called drone. So you get the idea here, this is the object detection labeling for Azure Machine Learning. Once you're done labeling, you come back to Vision Studio, you import your training data, and then you train a model. I have here a model which is already trained. Um, so uh, let me click on that. You can see here, let's see if I can bring it up. Uh, you can see here the model accuracy, which is determined on the training data set. We, we have added an evaluation run, so you can evaluate the model with additional data sets. And then the last thing that I want to show you is if you want to test your model, then this is an object detection model. So on detect common objects on images, here you can select from the pre-trained vision model versus the custom model that you trained with and then you bring an image and then you run inference. That's amazing. Now, is this is this doing like a, is this changing the base model or is it building an adaptation model on top of the base model or what is it doing exactly? So the, the foundation model uh, serves as the uh, basis for applying transfer learning. Mm -hmm. um, and I, should, I shouldn't say the foundation model, the adaptation models uh, above. So basically an That's adaptation right. model for object detection saves as, uh, as, as uh, the, the basis for applying transfer learning. And we have object detection and image classification. So the adaptation model for image classification is gonna save, is gonna be the basis for transfer learning for image classification. Uh, this has all been really amazing. Where can people go to find out more? Um, well, we have the link on the screen. So Vision Studio, ak.ms Vision Studio. So this is the portal that I showed you here. Um, go ahead, try things out. This is a no-code experience. And when you are ready to uh, test the APIs, then we have documentation, and then you can test the APIs as well. Well, Adina, this has been amazing. I can understand why we're so excited about Project Florence, at least why I'm excited about it. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Glad to be here and uh, very excited about the Vision AI capabilities for cognitive services. Please try it out. Awesome. We've been learning all about next generation computer vision capabilities with Project Florence on the <coughs> AI Show. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully we'll see you next time. Take care. That was cool. Look at look at look at us go. I now for those there was a question. I'm going to we're going to get to the questions here because I want to make sure we get to all of them. The first question that I had that was really good was hold on, hold on. I want to make sure uh, I get to it.
Uh, he, he said, I see old Windows. Is this a CV presentation from previous years? No, this is like we recorded this on, what is it, Thursday or Friday, Adina? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, old Windows logo. I apologize. Like we're, <laughs> <laughs> we picked up the wrong logo. <laughs> Not only that, it's just like, I don't know. We're we're like the technical people, and we don't think about that stuff. We, we think about like AI models, and we forget about logos. <laughs> cool beads. Okay, so here's a couple of other questions. Here's a here's a good question. What's the difference between this foundation model and Clip? I actually I went to the paper, Adina, because I thought people would ask something like that. Here, here's the here's the the paper, uh, and here's the here's the part that I think helps. Uh, so you can go to the paper and read about it. Um, but Clip is similar, right, Adina? Yeah, so um, I've talked about the language encoder and the image encoder. So the language encoder for the Florence Foundation model, uh, the architecture is based on the, it's it's using the Clip model architecture. So you can say that they are similar in, in, the, in the structure. It, you know, it's using mm -hmm. transformers and it's based on Clip, but then it has been trained with data you know, in, you know, independent of clip. So think of it as like uh, different weights because the training data is different. Fantastic. That's another great question. Uh, another one. Let's see. Uh, I'm probably. I'm sure there's probably parts of this question that we probably can't answer right now, just because I don't know. But there's probably questions that we can. What's the model size for this task? What kind of machine is it running on? What's the cost and latency? So um, I can't give you like one size. Um, uh, so each adaptation model has like different sizes. And of course, there's the size of the large foundation model. Um, I, I won't be able to code that, what that is exactly. Uh, but what I can tell you is that the resulting models, they have like different sizes. And then we are training. Um, when we train the adaptation models, we are looking to train different size models, applying different distillation techniques. Um, at this point, the models are hosted on uh, in the Azure Cloud in the Cognitive Services backend. Um, they are on the large size uh, because we're looking to showcase the accuracy of the model. So we pick the models with the highest accuracy, which happen to be like the, the largest models. Um, and uh, you do not run these models on your machine. So basically, they run on GPUs in the Azure Cloud. In the fullness of time, we're looking to also bring these models at the edge. Uh, so I'm going to ask the obvious question, uh, like there is the custom vision model. So there's the custom vision service. And then these models with Project Florence, they are uh, brought to production. You can use them in the computer vision service. So now you have like two services that provide customization. And I think like the obvious question is like, when, when, I, when do I use one versus the other? Um, so the large foundation model, this is like transformers based models. This is like the latest state of the art. And then you have the custom vision service, which is using the convolution network based models. Right. Um, and then if you, if you need to run models at the end, at the edge with like small compact models, you still use the, the custom vision service, the existing service. Um, and like I said, in the fullness of time, we're going to bring the large foundation model slash adaptation models to the edge. Uh, but for this release, we're not there yet. Got it. And the cost, it's like a fraction of a cent per call, right? Um, you can find, so if you go under uh, Azure Computer Vision, there's the pricing page, and then you can see the pricing for uh, for uh, some of these adaptation tasks. Some of them do not have pricing yet because we are still trying to figure out like, what is the right and, and and fair price. Got it, perfect. Here's another question. Any limitation to the quality on, on quality of images that you need to put in? Um, I assume that's a question for custom model training. Um, mm -hmm. So let me say- And even for usage, let's just say for, like I just wanna use the, 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 the adaptation models as is without anything. Like for example, for the vector search that thing that you did, what's the what size images should people put in there minimum? Um, this is this is your your typical image, you know, anything that you you know probably most people are gonna try it with like uh, images from their like personal phones. 
Um, so, you know, any, any kind of these images would work. And then if you have like blurry images, of course, like the quality of the model, you know, is going to vary depending on the, on the quality of your image. Yeah. Makes sense. If you're passing in super pixelated, like tiny, like 50 yeah. by 50 image, it's going to be a problem. Sure. I mean, try it. Um, <laughs> 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 it's just like uh, maybe it'll work i, I don't maybe know it'll uh, work. <laughs> yeah, maybe it'll that, work that's the, that's the beauty with the large foundation model like uh, it's still like a lot of data and uh, sometimes you know it, it amazes people with what they can do here's a really good question that i think there's a subtext to but i think it's important to to, to analyze isn't it possible to implement this with no ai and, and what is the benefits i guess it i guess it is possible but that's going to be some crazy code right <laughs> i don't even know how to like <laughs> um i don't think there is a way i i don't think so either uh, i mean of course like if you want to you can write an algorithm to where you pass in an image and then it looks for a certain pattern a certain way but uh that's like light years behind from what an AI model can do. Yeah, because like honestly, pictures, I don't know. They're like, it comes from like this stochastic world. So we need to use stochastic methods to figure out what's in them, right? I don't know how you could do an imperative, you know, loop over things. Uh -huh. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say you cannot do it. I, I'm okay, do it. <laughs> you're smarter than me, so I'm gonna believe it. Um, okay, another one is uh, Jorge was saying, "Wow, that was really fast when we did the video thing." Um, did it Did it load? Did it load? Look at the video before you did the query. So the way it works, and try it out. You'll you'll see it for yourself. So you come in with your own video and you load the video. And the, in, the video is going to be indexed, meaning okay. that you are going to have to wait, depending on the size of the video, you are going to have to wait a few seconds, a minute. Like I said, like the larger the video, the longer you wait. And then what happens is we sample frames from the video, and then each frame is, is being, you know, the vector is being pushed to the model. We extract mm -hmm. vectors. So, yes, there's a little bit of like a wait time for indexing the video. But once the video is indexed, the search query is pretty much what you've seen there yeah. because it's just a matter of like comparing the vectors. I mean, uh, calculating the similarity for a vector. And you could do that like parallel, like super fast, uh, especially even if, it, even if a video is like pretty long, it's still not a lot of frames. I mean, how are you sampling like sub-second frames? Uh, so we, we are still playing with like what is the right, you know, yeah. Second. So think of it as if your if your video is streaming at 30 frames per second and you sample a single frame per second, you're missing lots of the frames. So sometimes yeah. you'll find that we don't find something and you're thinking like, oh, I, you know, it's there. Why, how come I cannot find it? Like, you know, it depends on like if the frames are in between like the sample frames. So that's why we are still playing with like what is the right frame rate such that we do not miss this, you know, key events. Yeah. And that's. That's smart. So yes, uh, to answer your question, Jorge, it looks like super fast to find things in videos, uh, but there is a little bit of indexing and it's literally just pushing the frames through the model and getting the, 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 the image in the latent space so that then you can match it to text. Is Am I getting this right? Yep. All right. So uh, Jason, uh, just a little commentary. Great work. Looking forward to checking these new tools out. And you can do that. You can use them today, right? We released them last week. Uh, that's right. So Vision Studio, that's the place, aka.ms Vision Studio. Uh, it's a Ooh. no code experience. Um, the video search, uh, it's, it's still in demo stage, meaning that you can bring your own video, you can try it. There is no API for that yet. Uh, the image search, uh, it's you can try it and then um, you can click on the links to the documentation and we have an API for that one as well. That's cool. Now, when you when you index the video, all the vectors are stored in your service account, or how, how where are those? Where is the index stored? The index. So when you when you store the video, the index is is stored um, on the service side into your tenant, uh, and then you br bring your video from your own blob storage. Mm, here's Jorge saying you can 
you can make a no ML solution for a very specific demo and be sure it does. And you, I bet you could for like a very specific demo. So that that's actually true, but not in a general way. All right, Adina, any further things you'd like to share with folks as they're here uh, about Vision Studio? I have the links here for those that want. Here's Vision Studio. Uh, make sure you go there, aka.ms Vision Studio. And then here's, if you want to learn more about cognitive services for vision and the pricing, et cetera, that's all here, right? Yeah, the only thing I um, I, I, I think I didn't mention uh, for model customization, the existing model customization technique techniques uh, for convolutional networks uh, it takes like hundreds of images or some large number of images to train a custom model with high accuracy right. with the large foundational model because the the foundation you know the the model itself has been you know has a lot of knowledge. Um, we enable what we call few shot learning, meaning that you can train a custom model with two images uh, per label. Um, and then, of course, your accuracy will vary, right? But you can start by, with something really small, uh, train a custom model, uh, use it. And then as you use it, we have also a data sampling API. And then basically, you can continue to collect images from your, you know, as you use the model, into your training data set and then you can label the data and then you can retrain the model and continue to to improve your model we we call that active learning loop so uh, we have that as well um try it out um and like i said model customization it works for object detection and image classification at this time uh, the custom models are hosted in the azure cloud and then in the fullness of time we're looking to bring this at the edge as well that's, I mean, that's just cool stuff. Uh, just the fact that we're we're pushing a lot of the model work down in, in into large foundational models, and then the adaptations are much better. Yeah, because with the old convolutional stuff, you had to have a couple hundred images, and now you're saying it just it learned, uh, and so we keep those those learnings, and then we can adapt a lot faster. That's right, and. Um... I guess the last thing I'm going to say is um, responsible AI. So think mm -hmm. about like what does it take to uh, build uh, and use models in a responsible way. Um, we have we we as as usual even for these models we will provide uh, our uh, documentation and our responsible AI guidance. Um, and what I want to share here is that because we. We want to make sure that all our adaptation models, yeah, you know, can be used responsibly. We've put a lot of work into making sure that the training data set for the large foundational model has been extensively curated such that it meets the responsible AI needs. Um, so both the large foundation model and the adaptation models, um, you know, we've we've done a lot of work to make sure that um, responsible AI is is still a top priority. And that's that's awesome. Uh, you should always, before using any of these models, think about who is it affecting and how could it potentially harm those people from a wide swath and array of, of different people's cultures, languages, etc. So this is a, a very good call. Out. Adina, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. We should have you on again soon when there's a new vision thing. Hopefully sometime soon. Sounds good. All right. We'll see you later. All right, that was Adina Trufinescu. She's awesome, uh, isn't she? Like, there's some amazing stuff uh, from her. Here's a question from Jamie. Uh, will it be possible, for example, to read a QR or a bi barcode and the description in the case of a product? I think you can do actually much more than that with the adaptation model. You can just have a picture of the thing. And that's it. It's kind of bananas, right? Uh, that you could have that, which is really cool. All right, friends, what were your thoughts of this stuff? Are you going to go try it out? I hope you will. While you're answering that question, I think I'll go back to my screen because, wow, we uh, we have 10 minutes to work on our stuff. <laughs> By the way, I had this paper open still. Uh, this is the uh, Florence model, a new foundation model for computer vision. Yeah, sure. Uh, people are asking for the link again. The link to Cognitive Services Vision Studio is right here. Let me cover up my ugly mug at k.ms forward slash vision studio. You can go there now. I think 
I think there's some stuff you can try out for free there, actually, which is really cool. And the the cool thing, the other, the super cool thing here. Let me let me move my. The super cool thing about this is that um, you don't have to build the AI model. You could just use it, which is fantastic. So make sure you go there, Vision Studio. And then if you want to learn about pricing and the service in general, uh, uh, aka dot ms forward slash cognitive services forward slash vision vision uh so go there um and try it out like you could like imagine the class of applications and services you could build as a startup like uh that's what these new ai uh tools are doing it like people are building general like microsoft in particular are building these general models in partnership with other companies that you can just use to pave the way for brand new avenues of of uh, optimization success and just the betterment of humanity uh so make sure you have that in mind as well which is i think that's the coolest part like you can go like can you imagine the number of of uh cool startups that you can do just with this new service analyzing and finding things in videos um you know, uh, text and uh, vision representations together. I mean, that's it's all just coolness. So um, I'm excited to see what y'all will build next. Um, uh, let's see. Yes, uh, here we go. Uh, AK. Oh, it's too fast. I'll put it up quicker. Uh, here it is. Uh, AKA dot ms forward slash vision studio. I'm using my uh, my fake accent there. Uh, so there's that one, Vision Studio. Uh, in fact, let me let me let's go let's go to these links right here, aka.ms uh, Vision Studio. Voila, here it is. Uh, and you can see here's all this all this goodness. Um, optical character recognition, spatial analysis, and then image analysis. The second link, uh, the second link is this one, aka.ms forward slash cognitive service forward slash vision, vision. And there's the pricing and stuff that was promised, uh, pricing details, etc cool beans uh so you've got them all but here's uh here's the goodness of it i mean this is cool boost content discoverability with image analysis yeah no joke look at that person holding a spatula person wearing a yellow apron look at the fun these folks are having look at that yeah i'm hungry i want some food um uh, pretty cool stuff here Stream video in real time with spatial analysis. Uh, OCR. This is probably the old. Let's. I'm wondering. OCR, OCR. How long has OCR been around? Optical character recognition. Oh, that's a cognitive service. Uh, I wonder if I could Wikipedia. Wikipedia it. Wikipedia. No. This is, Wikipedia's got the wrong thing. Wikipedia.com OCR. When did it start? Optical character recognition. Optical character recognition or optical character reader is the electron. Yes, history. Wow. In the late 1920s, Emmanuel Goldberg developed what he called a statistical machine for searching microfilm using optical code recognition system. Wow. Ray Kurzweil started the company Kurzweil Computer Products. OCR has been around forever. Wow. This is amazing. Amazing, amazing. So, yeah. AI has been around forever, making lives better since the 1920s, apparently. Wow. I need to, I feel like I need to look into this because this is way earlier than I had thought. Um, 1920s Emmanuel Goldberg
that's cool. All right, so we have about <laughs> five minutes. <sighs> uh, this isn't the project I want to show you. <laughs> Rochembo. All right. <laughs> For those that are wondering what the heck this Rochambeau project is. Oh, wow. What is this timeline? I've never seen this before. Interesting. I don't know what this is. Here we go. Here we go. TypeScript JSX. Auto detect. Yes. You got it right. You got it right. All right. Let's do this. Uh, CD web. Uh, CED. <laughs> The CD web and then LS and then yarn, yarn dev. And here we go. What are we doing? Local, local host. I want to change this one day to be like, to be like, loco host, loco host, 3000. About 3000. Wouldn't that be funny? Wouldn't we all have like a great laugh? L Loco host 3000. I gotta put the walk on music on now. <laughs> walk on music. Oh man, uh, because we only got like three minutes left. Loco host 3000. Uh, train control shift I. What do we got going on here in the in the consoles? Loco host. Oh, there's a way to do it. Surly Dev in the, he's like, you can add it to your hosts file. Kaboo! Loco host. Wow. I love it. What a good idea. <laughs> By the way, um, yep. Adding key listener. Indeed. Over constrained. Space, space. Oh. Space, 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 space. Space, 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 space. So what I want to do for those wandering is I want to be able to hit the space bar and then just capture images like every, you know, half a second or something. And we could make it. We could make it go with our music, you know. So that's what I want to do uh, next time. It looks like next time. Also, if you're wondering, we are going to be talking about the latest model updates in Azure Form Recognizer with Vinod Kerpad, who is a a regular here uh, on the show. So we're excited for that. And also, look, if you're working on something exciting with AI, we want to know about it. If you have built a product, if you have like paved the way, like for example, with this new Florence model to do something amazing, we want to hear about it. And we want to participate in the goodness of it all so that we can share. Um. I think for moving forward, one thing I want to do is I want to be able to maybe we can find a way to to use like YOLO V6 or I, what's the latest YOLO version to maybe put a box around this and then build a model on top of that to recognize it. And maybe we can chain them together uh, to do that, you know, because then YOLO could figure out what to focus on. And then the top layer can figure out if it's rock, paper, scissors. That would be a much, much better algorithm, I think, in general. So, uh, again, thank you so much for being with us uh, this week on the AI Show. As always, we enjoy having you here, and we love the participation. So make sure every Monday morning at 8.30 Pacific time, we will be here next time on the AI Show. Vinod Kirpad, what's new in Azure Form Recognizer? Thank you so much for being with us, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Take care.